Uh, my name is Will Pomeranz. I'm Deputy Director of the Kennan Institute. And I'd like to welcome you to the Wilson Center. Uh, a few uh, administrative matters before we get to our main event. Uh, on Wednesday, March 13th, uh, that's this week, we will have the book launch of Austin Cars Carson's Secret, Se Secret Wars Covert Conflict in International Politics. Uh, professor Carson is an assistant professor at the University of Chicago and more importantly is a Kennan Institute Title VIII alumni, alum. And then on Thursday, March 21st at 3 p.m., we will have a talk by our current Title VIII research fellow, Maria Blackwood, who is going to be talking about capital relocation and the making of Soviet Kazakhstan, 1920 to 29. Well, we're very pleased to have uh, Professor Martin Gilman here today. This is another in our continuing series, co-sponsored by the Daniel Morgan Graduate School. Uh, and today we're going to be talking about how Russia is surviving Western sanctions. And there is probably no one better to talk about this issue than Dr. Martin Gilman, who is a professor of economics at the Higher School of Economics in Moscow. Uh, previously, he was with the International Monetary Fund for 24 years, where he was assistant director in the IMF's policy department. Uh, his extensive experience with Russia began as an advisor uh, from the policy department on the negotiating missions from June 1993, and then he moved to Russia in Thank you, Will. Um, for those of you who were actually able to attend the talk on February 4th by Nigel um, uh, Gould Davies and uh, Daniel Ahn, uh, my intention today is, in a sense, to continue, particularly with what uh, Nigel uh, was, was discussing a few weeks ago here. <laughs> Uh, about about sanctions and Rus Russia, um, and unlike Nigel, though I have no particular experience in a as a as a diplomat or anything like that. So I'm an economist, mm -hmm. and maybe I should make a couple of personal caveats so you get a little sense of where my worldview is coming from. Because um, I'm born and raised in Memphis, I had nothing to do with Russia. It's just uh, one of those flukes of my IMF career. Um, and while I was kind of interested in politics and all that, I didn't really pursue it after I left. I did, I did go to SICE, uh, but that was before I went to the London School of Economics and did proper economics, which I found a little bit more coherent and juicy compared to politics, which is kind of, anyway. Um, so uh, I'm an economist, but also I, since 2005, when I left the IMF, uh, I took pre early retirement from the IMF. Uh, my wife and I were living in Bethesda, and we had to decide whether we were going to continue raising the children in Bethesda uh, as they started to get a little at school age, or whether we were going to go back to Moscow. And for various family reasons, we went back to Moscow, and I've been there ever since 2005. Um, and I have a, a particular perch, which is rather interesting for an American living in Moscow. Uh, thus far, and I'll come to that in a few minutes, I've been able to avoid uh, the uh, trials and tribulations of Michael Calvi. I hope that that continues. Um, but I have a perch where I live a very, as an American, I live a very integrated life with uh, my Russian wife and, uh, and our friends, uh, all, all of whom because my wife Tanya was the uh, heroine of the, of the Putsch against uh, Gorbachev in August 1991. She was the young Russian journalist who stood up and challenged Yanayev in that uh, in that press conference. And so she's got a reputation in Russian journalism that's much more established than mine would ever be in the country. Um, and so, by that nature and her nature, almost all of our friends are what the Russians would call liberalni intelligentsia. And um, who are a very much a threatened class of, of people in Russia. And I will, whoops, that's not supposed to happen. 
All right. Thought I had it off. Okay. All right. Um, I mentioned those points of view just to say that, uh, or those perspectives, just to give you the flavor that um, I don't have a kind of a conventional institutional view about uh, what's happening in Russia. Um, but I, I would consider it fairly well informed just on, on the basis of, of my own interest and uh, what I teach in terms of economics at the higher school and the feedback from my students and, and other professors. Um, so what I would like to do uh, briefly, if I may, because I'd like to have plenty of time for discussion, um, is to, to basically, let's see, how do I do this? Okay. To, um, what I'd like to do is consider basically three themes here, if I may. Um, and the first one is, is just, if you can see this, can you see it? Yes. Okay. Um, the, the first one is simply that um, in terms of the economic effects of sanctions, and I guess I'll be kind of grouping macro sanctions and targeted sanctions uh, together, uh, the, the macro data are ambiguous, and I'm going to show you, or ambivalent, ambiguous is better. And I'll show you a few charts just to make the point that, um, that uh, they probably do negatively affect uh, the Russian economic performance, all else being equal, but it's very difficult not knowing the counterfactual how you would, how you would assess that. Um, and that's a particular problem in the size of a country like, uh, like Russia. But what does seem to be certain, uh, and I'll walk you through that very quickly in this first point, is that the economy is recovering from the trough of 2005 and is slowly doing better. Uh, so I take a very different starting point, at least in terms of the um, uh, semantics from what <coughs> Nigel was saying uh, uh, four weeks ago here. Um, the, the second point about, whoops, second point, well, what did I do? Oh, oh, there it is. The second point is um, that now most Russians that I'm familiar with uh, consider that sanctions are a permanent feature of life in the foreseeable future, uh, perhaps even longer than the Jackson Bannock uh, Amendment. It will just, it'll be just part of life. Um, and that um, as, a, as a consequence of that, they have taken steps to reorient the economy um, and make it more resilient. Um, and so you can read the point I, that no doubt there's cost involved, but the Russian economy will continue to cope. And I'll, I'll come and kind of point out uh, some, <coughs> some cases uh, around that second theme. Uh, the third theme is a little bit more subtle, um, and I'll come to that, which is that the consequences of this reorientation, in my view, over time, is not only um, unfortunate, I would even say dangerous for Russia itself, uh, but I think counterproductive to American and Western interests as well over the longer term. Um, but I don't have any particular helpful alternative to suggest to you. Uh, of what would be better than sanctions. Um, so let me, uh, let me uh, kind of go through um, uh, these points, if I may, just to, just to say that, um, yeah, no, let, before showing a slide, let's just start with a little thought experiment. Think about, okay, countries that you know in the world, but you don't, you don't have a name. Just a thought experiment, no name. Um, you have an economy, it's a G20 country, um, it's uh, got positive economic growth, it has uh, positive real interest rates, it has low inflation, it has virtually no public debt, it has a uh, triple surplus, that is it's got a surplus on trade, a surplus on current account, and a surplus in its budget, as, yeah, as I said, uh, virtually no public debt. Um, it's, um, it's got credit ratings, uh, investment grade trade credit ratings from all of the invest, uh, credit agencies, including Moody's after the 10th of February. Um, in uh, the World Bank's doing business, it's gone from position of 100, uh, ranked 124th out of the 190 something countries in 2012 to, by the end of last year, 40th position. That's a huge jump in six years in the World Bank's doing business. 
Um, uh, it also has among the uh, the second highest reserve level in the world after China itself. Well, I know, I guess Japan is still ahead, so third. And then um, it, in terms of macroeconomic management, it had has a team. It has had a team in place uh, for going on two decades now that have experienced a lot of shock. They know what they're doing. Uh, they're well honed to cope with whatever challenges are being thrown at them. Now, would you have guessed that the name of this country is Russia? Maybe, but it's not obvious when you look at when I look at some of the things that are often said. Um, within the beltway here, not the, the ring road in Moscow. Um, but let me just, uh, because you can look at charts later if uh, they'll be posted somewhere, but just to give you some idea um, that uh, Russia's GDP, even in dollar terms, has been coming back. Uh, and it's, it, was, it was weaker, of course, in 2015. 15, uh, Russia hit the, uh, the bottom of the trough in, in Russian ruble terms, in dollar terms just a, slightly thereafter. Um, and economic growth is coming back. It was 2.3 percent uh, real growth last year, a little bit of a quirk with the construction numbers. But basically, economy is doing better, uh, but no one expects it to do anything great, okay? Uh, maybe about 1.5 percent this year. Um, but then again, if you look at numbers for Western Europe, it's basically the same story. And it's the, the same kind of characteristics. Uh, labor force is stagnating. There's not a growth in the labor force. Um, and productivity is not really going up very much. So the same kind of factors that you find in Europe afflicts also the, the Russian economy. Um, the, um, but so, but, you know, GDP is going up. You've got uh, real interest rates, which are going up. And this is, I'll come back to this point about the resilience of the Russian economy vis-a-vis -vis sanctions. Uh, this monetary story, uh, you see the black line is the, is the central bank rate here. I don't know if there's a pointer there or not. Um, the black line, keeping positive policy rates is a very important uh, goal for them uh, in terms of creating resilience for the economy. Um, uh, as you can see here, the, um, uh, the Russian ruble has weakened uh, relative to um, <coughs> the period before sanctions started, but that's essentially an oil story. Um, and here, uh, the, the important one is that imports um, are not, uh, imports are not going up, um, in fact, or, or very barely, and not, certainly not at the rate of economic growth. So imports as a percentage of GDP is coming down, which explains why the current account and the trade, trade balance are becoming so positive. Yes, exports, exports are doing better. Um, but it's mostly that imports have been coming down. And part of that story is reaction to sanctions and the count Russian counter sanctions, where food imports in particular are being replaced by import substitution. Um, uh, this, the story here is that disposable income, though, has been stagnating, actually dipping a little bit, um, which uh, you've probably read about making uh, a lot of stories about uh, the Russian population being very unhappy uh, with the regime, et cetera, that uh, disposable income is not increasing and that people are feeling uh, worried. And that uh, in the post-election uh, period that uh, uh, the regime's popularity has, uh, in the polls, has decreased uh, by about 20 percentage points. Um, my point here, though, being that uh, it's also partly in reaction to the, my point, too, about the sanctions regime because what they are doing is um, not only maintaining these very high positive interest rates, which are strangling business, um, but they are, uh, they've done this pension reform, uh, 
to make the pension uh, uh, more self-financing and sustainable, uh, but that was very unpopular. Uh, and, then, and then they've also increased a two percentage point increase in the VAT, the value added tax, uh, starting this uh, January 1st, this past January 1st, also very unpopular. Um, it ticked up inflation in January, so they didn't like that because Russians are very adverse to and very worried about inflation. And they also increased oil taxation. So combination of all these is a environment where people may understand the Kremlin's argument that you need to do this for the future, but they don't want to pay the price right now. And why should they pay? Why couldn't somebody else pay that price? Um, the, um, but one thing that you do see here is that, um, so you see the stagnating labor productivity and, um, and real wages are, they're okay. Depends on, but there's a, a, a lot of differentiation between sectors of the economy. Um, but here the, the story is that the budget is in big surplus. Um, and the, the point that I always like to look at here, and ever since I started getting involved with the Russian economy in uh, 1993, my favorite indicator has always been to look at money demand as an economist. And that, that's that first uh, block here, M2 divided by GDP. And broad money divided by GDP. And what does it tell you? If It tells you if money demand is low, then people don't usually have a lot of confidence in their own economy, which unfortunately, while sure, M2 to GDP has gone up in Russia, what is it now, uh, about 35 percent? Oh, no, almost 40 percent. Um, but that is extremely low. That basically means that people just hold enough ruble money to, for current transactions. They don't hold rubles as an instrument of savings or investment. And that has always been very worrying for me. Any country where people do not want to hold its own cur currency, uh, you have to ask yourself a lot of questions. Um, and if you compare it to, you know, Anywhere in Eastern Europe, it's much higher, 80%. Western Europe, it would be over 100%. So it's rather strange to have such <coughs> low money demand at this, at this stage. Um, so let's see if there's any. Uh, oh, yeah, but one other, uh, uh, just to, to sh throw in just uh, among the, the things that are happening in Russia on the kind of positive side, as I was referring to with this mysterious country earlier, um, the stock market has, keeps going up and up. Uh, it's been doing extremely well. And why is that? Well, I'm not entirely sure. But I've never understood why stock markets go up and down. If I did, I probably wouldn't be doing <laughs> what I'm doing. Okay. Um, so coming, coming a little bit more, looking at the future, and, and then I want to go to, uh, quickly to my second theme because Will is going to start getting um, uh, concerned about my talking too much, um, is uh, I always like this uh, kind of graph because it shows you, um, these are by Sparebank's uh, um, Capital Investment Bank, um, what, uh, what are the factors driving GDP? And what you can see here, which is, I think, quite significant, is what you had ru driving Russia, Russian GDP uh, was, invest uh, was consumption. But now what the new plan, 1919-2021, is investment. And this is all tied in with um, uh, some of you may have, have seen what, what uh, is called in Russia the May program that uh, President Putin announced actually last April. But uh, I think I have it somewhere here. Yeah, the, uh, the, the, they have this very ambitious set of, of, of largely social goals because they understood when they were introducing the uh, pension reform and the VAT changes and everything else that it was going to hurt and that people were really unhappy. So uh, they, they, they certainly looked at polls and they understood that they've got to uh, make some big changes. And so this is what was promised last May. Now, uh, are they going to deliver on that? That's going to be pretty hard to make, uh, 
to become a top um, a top five economy in the world. Uh, and this is supposed to be by what 2021 over three years. Um, uh, productivity growth of five percent. Uh, nobody does that anymore. So it's it's an extremely ambitious uh, plan for the for Russia. But you can see it's very much focused. Uh, you don't see anything about military spending or anything here. Uh, I think that they, the, the view was by the time that uh, the president made this speech uh, and presented this stuff in May, that the re-equipment of the military has gone on and has done its job, and that now they really need to switch to living standards, infrastructure, business climate, human capital, et cetera. However, um, as we will discuss in a moment, that doesn't always work uh, the way they intended in May. Um, so let me just uh, go on to say that in, in the second theme, um, that the Russians look at the sanction regime starting in March 2014 and that has intensified over the last five years, uh, not only do they see it as permanent, but inevitably, and this is, um, I guess, my first point about the this, um, sanction, their attitude towards sanctions, is that um, the sanction regime is not only not going to go away, but it's, um, uh, they consider it really an American domestic political issue. They don't see it as something that they are involved with or even negotiating with the U.S. or, or even the Europeans um, because they, they see that it's such a, a preoccupation in the states uh, as a political issue domestically that no one's going to believe anything that the Russians would say anyway, which, as I gather, is probably true. Um, so uh, they don't even pretend to. The second point here is that, um, at least in, in Moscow, I can't say for the regions because I don't spend a lot of time out there, but the, at least in Moscow there is very little talk about sanctions. Nobody talks about sanctions. You don't see anything on, on popular TV programs. or Nobody talks about sanctions. The only time people talk about sanctions, or the only people who talk about sanctions, are when Russians are talking to foreigners. Because foreigners think sanctions are important. So with foreigners visiting or talking to foreigners, sure, they talk sanctions because that's what foreigners are interested in. Um, but from, I don't think I'm exaggerating too much to say that really they do not consider the sanctions themselves to be um, a relevant point of, of interest in, in kind of Russian normal life. They're just, they're just there in the background at, in the kind of broad foreign policy area. Um, the, um, the third, uh, oh, and I can also, just on per, in, in personal terms, I can also say that I've, I've seen that because up until the end of last year, just three months ago, less than three months ago, uh huh. Okay, I get the message. Okay, um, that up until up until then, I was I was actually on the board of Sparebank uh, for four years during the sanctions regime, uh, as well as Societe Generale's Ross Bank. So I was on the board of these two banks and saw certainly from the financial sector side what was happening. And you know, there was in the board discussions there was really no discussion about sanctions per se. Um, they're just some areas, like in spare banks, overseas operations uh, in, in Eastern Europe or where uh, there could be concerns, but that's more with the European regulator and Russia's reputation with the European regulator rather than actual sanctions issues per se. Um, the, um, the, another point that I wanted to make here in this second general one um, is that uh, we're facing a very dynamic situation. It's not like sanctions are uh, a still target that you're trying, you know, with a bow and arrow you're trying to shoot. Um, the, the countries that are being sanctioned, in this case Russia, are obviously uh, doing a lot to counterbalance those sanctions. Uh, so they are not, uh, they are not sitting still. Um, and um, 
I, I remember an article uh, that uh, my daughter who wants to call me, so I better tell her no. Um, so uh, the um, Leonid uh, Bershitsky, who's a, a good friend of mine who works at Bloomberg in Berlin, uh, wrote an article a few months ago talking about the way that different Russian institutions have reacted in this dynamic situation <laughs> to being targeted. And he said, you know, there are companies like Sparebank and, um, and say, uh, Novatech, uh, uh, which is a uh, gas company, that have reacted quite differently, say, from Gazprom Bank or, or, uh, uh, or say, Gazprom itself. So he said it depends a lot on the management of these particular companies, how they, how they react and whether it was dynamic or not. Like the figures on the economy. Um, some companies have been resistant to sanctions, others have not. I know that you know, when, when uh, Dan, uh, Daniel Ahn was presenting his data, uh, looking at uh, targeted sanctions in a group of companies, um, he said you know, that it, you know, they seem to have some effect on the companies, but it depends on which companies. Uh, they're, very, they're very different. Um, uh, as Bershitsky points out, there's also some issues with Daniel's sample, but, uh, but I think that Daniel's made a valid point in trying to uh, at least add an empirical flavor here. Um, the, the another, besides this dynamic element, uh, another uh, third point here is that um, Russia is not alone. Um, uh, there are other countries that do not impose sanctions on Russia, okay? In fact, the only countries, and but they're big ones, that impose sanctions are the ones in green, okay? Everywhere else in the world, there are no sanctions of any kind. So it's, uh, if you're, you know, <coughs> if you're in Turkey or Israel or uh, China, you know, et cetera, um, life goes on as, as usual. So it's uh, the lack of, lack of universality to the sanctions is certainly making it uh, very difficult to achieve uh, the goals uh, that those imposing sanctions would want. And one of the things which is very interesting is how quickly things are changing. Um, I was just looking at, uh, where do I have that number? Oh, on, uh, these are foreign exchange reserves uh, proportions uh, held at the Central Bank of Russia over just a change in one year, because uh, there's a lag in the data, between July 20, end of July 2017 and end of July 2018. And you can see that the dollar proportion of reserves um, has plummeted from 46% to 22%. And that uh, Chinese want, uh, renminbi, which were non-existent in 2017, now make up 15% of the reserves. And this is changing, I mean, I'm sure that by now, according to my friends at the Central Bank, this is changing very rapidly. Because the, the Russians understood uh, that after the dollar was weaponized, as they call it, not just the Russians, but others call it, the weaponization of the dollar, I think the French in particular call it the weaponization of the dollar, um, after the, um, the $8.9 billion fine imposed on BNP Paribas, uh, when was that, in June uh, 2014, uh, because of, uh, what they were doing as a conduit for Sudan, and I think, uh, okay, okay, we really have to, okay. Um, <clears throat> uh, so I better move to my third point quickly. Okay, so I better jump over all that. Uh, okay, maybe we'll have time in the, okay. Um, so my third point is simply that there are unintended consequences of, uh, of sanctions, um, and that, um, uh, you know, one point here is that uh, they don't seem to be affecting Russian behavior, but I'm not an expert on Russian behavior, but they don't seem to be affecting Russian behavior. If anything, they seem to be hardening attitudes and um, making it more difficult, in a sense, for them to take uh, the United States seriously as a country uh, because uh, the U.S. is imposing sanctions for all kinds of various reasons. It's not even clear. I mean, some of the sanctions are, I mean, related to very various various things. Um, 
The, the second point here is that um, uh, the unintended consequence, it's created a siege mentality. Uh, circle the wagons. Uh, the Russians are patriotic, just like we are here, and so they uh, generally see that if they're being ganged, ganged up on by some of the major countries, they, they push back. Um, uh, the, the, what I consider really the dangerous uh, problem is that um, uh, by sanctions, the, the kind of the good guys in Russia, I mean, I'd like to say some of the good guys that I know personally, um, uh, are, being, are being effectively marginalized. And so uh, who's going to be there in Russia when Putin is no longer there? Who is going to be the next generation of leaders in Russia that we hope to be able to, uh, to, be able to engage in uh, a more normal world that we hope will still exist? Um, and the longer this goes on and the more the liberals are uh, marginalized, um, I'm just concerned that uh, what we may end up with is something that may be even worse than what we perceive right now. Um, uh, and so uh, I don't know, and I anticipate a possible question, I don't know what's going to succeed Putin. Um, who or what, um, and I'm sure that, that uh, the people in the Kremlin now will take all the steps necessary to try to ensure that uh, people, like-minded people, will remain in control. Um, but we've seen a lot of regimes where they try to do that, uh, and I'm not sure that that's really going to play out. I can imagine, just like we've seen in this country, to the utter amazement of the whole world, um, or with the gilets jaunes in France, or with Brexit in Britain, uh, or Italian politics, that Russia may have its own populist surprises uh, that we may kind of think that we were out of the frying pan and into the fire. But maybe I should leave it at that before you stop me, and I can cover some of the other points later. Great. Thank you so much, Martin. I want to begin with just two questions, and I'm sure there'll be a lot more questions from the audience. And you talked about the perception that these sanctions are permanent. And no doubt from the U.S. perspective, since Congress now has to remove the sanctions, they probably are permanent or at least around for a long time. But for the Europeans, they have to meet every six months, mm. and they have to unanimously agree to continue the sanctions. Uh, there's plenty of suggestions that, at least in some countries, such as Italy, there's a willingness maybe to reject sanctions. So to what extent do Russia, does Russia believe it can separate U.S. and European sanctions at some point and only have to deal with the U.S. sanctions, admittedly, that are extraterritorial in, in, in their reach? But they might be able to get rid of the European sanctions. And my second question um, about... Um, the May decrees, and the question of who, who, wh wh where is this amazing growth and high quality jobs and everything going to come from? Uh, since it's, at least in the short term, it's not going to come from foreign investment, at least not Western foreign investment, uh, do you think that Putin is willing to spend some of those big hard currency reserves to jumpstart his economy, which he didn't do during the Great Recession? He basically told the Russian people, you know, their income was going to go down by half and good luck to you. Uh, is he, do you think that now he's, he's thinking that he has to jumpstart the economy in order to reach those May goals? Uh, thanks a lot, Will. Uh, both good questions. Uh, let me start with the last one. Um, I think that the Russians understand that they're going to have to use their own resources. In fact, one of the arguments about uh, sanctions is that, uh, or why sanctions may work in the long term, uh, that you hear, or at least I've heard here, is that um, Russia doesn't have the financial alternatives, doesn't have the, the, uh, the, the, the resources to do it itself. And I'm afraid that that's not really the case. I mean, Russia, is, Russia has built up a reserve that is really very impressive. They can use the National Wealth Fund. They've got huge foreign exchange reserves. Uh, they've got, as I said, almost zero public debt. So, and they've got credit lines with a lot of friendly countries. Uh, so they can uh, 
uh, finance a very ambitious public investment program. And that's, uh, that is what is intended uh, with, uh, with the finance beh behind here, uh, starting, starting later this year, but particularly in 2019, 2020, 2021, that is to be financed uh, with uh, higher debt levels of debt and the use of their internal resources. They do not have any illusion that they're going to get higher levels of foreign direct investment. They would like to, uh, but they know it's not going to come from the West. And because of secondary sanctions, effectively, no one I mean, we've seen that with Nord Stream 2. I mean, you know, when you're twisting arms, and this goes really to the, your second question uh, about getting around European sanctions, um, I, don't, I don't think that my understanding is that the Europeans are very, not, as long as there's a possibility of using secondary sanctions on European companies, there generally is not much incentive to remove the sanctions and, and upset the Americans because European business is immobilized anyway. They, they really can't do the kind of business that they would like to be doing, or maybe, maybe would like to be doing with Russia, as long as the Americans are opposed to it, because um, it will make life very difficult for European corporates to do that. Okay. Let's open the floor for questions here. Wayne. Uh, thank you. Wayne Mary, the American Foreign Policy Council. You have not mentioned the sector of agriculture, mm. but I might note that there's a, a really first-class article on that subject by Judy Twigg of Virginia Commonwealth University, also previously here of the Kennan Institute, mm -hmm. which should be coming out fairly soon, I hope, in the national interest. And anyone interested in the sanctions issue and their impact, I strongly recommend you read Judy Twigg's forthcoming article. Okay. Thanks. That's Other questions? Bill and Natalie. Uh, thank you. Uh, Bill Courtney with RAND. Mm -hmm. uh, in November, Bloomberg Economics uh, published an analysis saying that there had been a decrement of 6% of GDP since 2014 from the sanctions. Is that an estimate that you would agree with or not agree with? I don't. Well, I can't. I haven't read it, so I, I'm not. I'm not aware of the methodology that he might have said. I mean, it obviously would have been in. He had to suppose a counterfactual in the absence of something else relative to something else that GDP would have been six percentage points higher, and that sounds like a plausible methodology if you thought that without sanctions it would have been much better. Um, as I was saying, looking at the the data. Um, of what actually happened, if I have that somewhere, back in the back, beginning, um, you know, what, what most economists looking at the data would say, well, you know, that's really an oil story. Um, that's about the a collapse of the oil price starting in 2014 um, that happened to coincide with the, with the sanction regime. But I can imagine you could posit that um, even with uh, lower oil uh, revenues, that there would have been an inflow of investment. Something else could have happened, and you could have had higher growth. Yeah, it's possible. Natalie. Right down here. <laughs> Thank you. Um, two uh, quick questions, I guess. Uh, do you see the fact that people aren't talking about sanctions as evidence that they've simply accepted them or that they don't they don't th see them as big of a problem right because I, I think you could read that I mean you could ex assume that it's one can assume that it's both but it <laughs> could it it may be just that you know it, it may just be that talking about something that's simply there is kind of like well it's not great but you know what's the point of talking about it if it's not going away um, and the other question would be uh, on the chart with the, of the central bank bank reserves. How do you count? Um, and I'm not an economist; I'm a historian, so I apologize for my ignorance. For the growth of the reserves in euros and the de versus the versus the uh, reduction in the reserves in, in dollars, because that would seem to be telling a different, uh, a distinct story. Yeah. Well, I. I um, 
I think on the reserves, the, uh, the, the point is that they, they feel the, they don't feel that the euro has been weaponized to the extent, same extent as the, the dollar. I mean, there may be uh, concerns eventually on, on having you know, too much exposure in euro, but right now the European Central Bank, European authorities are not doing anything about euro, foreign holdings of euros that would be problematic for a country like Russia. In the case of the United States, since that uh, court decision on Ban Pay Paribas, any use of dollars outside the United States for any purpose is monitored, and everybody knows it. So that you always are taking a, if, if you're a foreign bank or if you're a, any foreign central bank, there are always risk involved now in using their perception, in using U.S. dollars uh, because it could, be, it could be subject to all kinds of uh, investigation or even seizure. So the, um, the willingness to diversify into euros is fine. Uh, in fact, um, I think that the Russians are praying that you know, the, 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 the euro remains as a relatively strong currency and that the effects of Brexit will not have or the, what, the pressures in Italy will have a deleterious effect on uh, the future of the euro. Yes. Hi, my name is Dimitri. Thank you very much for an interesting, very interesting presentation. Uh, two quick questions. First, I was wondering if you could say something about income inequality in Russia and the dynamics of it. Is it decreasing, increasing? And the other one about the stock market, if we know who the investors are, is it institutional investors or individual investors within Russia? Is the growth causing a buzz within Moscow? Thank you. Well, on the, on the last one first, on the stock market, I don't think um, – too many people follow um, the, the stock market, um, le even less here because people don't have um, uh, 401, you know, the equivalent of 401ks, and, you know, it would some kind of uh, uh, linkage in, in their retirement to, uh, to, to equities. So it's really a very narrow class of, of Russians who are interested in the market. And in fact, the market is probably fo followed more by foreigners uh, than by Russians themselves. I mean, there's very little interest in the market. And that, but that's why the arrest of Michael Calvi, Calvi on the 14th of February was so devastating uh, because um, anyone who had any kind of significant position that they were thinking of putting into Russian companies, um, either directly through private placement or through uh, the stock market should really probably have to think twice. And um, to my mind, I think I was saying to Yuval before we started here that the uh, the arrest of Calvi uh, is probably m more damaging in the longer run to I think Russia's real economic interest than say the sanctions themselves. I mean, Calvi's arrest is an outrageous outrageous step. And the fact that for what, an equivalent of supposedly the amount of money involved um, is $29 million, it's such peanuts in the overall context that uh, for whoever did this to feel that they can act with impunity to imprison uh, Calvi uh, is, is, is a devastating um, indictment in my mind of the, uh, in effect, lawlessness with which uh, some in Russia feel that they can, can uh, do what they want. And that in, I mean, it's fine to say that in the World Bank's uh, Doing Business Index that uh, uh, Russia's improved to 40th position, is now even better than a, a few OECD countries, um, but that's on paper. The Calvi arrest is a devastating indictment. And I, I can appreciate why uh, the Kremlin has not intervened, because, well, maybe I won't go into that here. But let's just say that uh, I can appreciate, but I think it's, it's um, unforgivable um, if they're concerned about the future. Right here. <clears throat> 
Hi, um, my name is Susan. I'm a dental fellow at SIPA. So I wanted to ask from you um, about the taxes in Russia. Um, because uh, as we can see it, the taxes are slowly but constantly raising. On the same time, the public service is uh, decreasing. You were mentioning the uh, pensions. So how do you explain it if the budget surplus is there? So why are the taxes on the same time still raising? Uh, I have to ask you a question. What taxes are... I mean, VAT, so... Oh, yeah. Oh, the VAT. Um, well, they didn't want to raise other, I mean, they decided to raise the VAT because they didn't want to raise other taxes. It's a very efficient tax in terms of economic distortions, um, and it raises, it raises a lot of money. But it's part of this siege mentality. It's part of the siege mentality. They want to build up uh, their resources so that they can resist if they need to, what they see is a very hostile international environment uh, for the future of the country. So they, they want to basically keep their powder dry. So uh, it's to have very large financial reserves, resources available that they can use as, uh, you know, the question was, how are they going to finance this ambitious investment program? Exactly uh, things like raising, raising the VAT. They do not intend... Uh, this is the first VAT increase since 2011. They do not intend to continue doing this. This was It's like the pension uh, reform. It's a one-off. Um, there is a question if, you know, if someday, if oil prices were to drop considerably from current levels, if oil was to go back to $40 a barrel, then everything would have to be reconsidered. Um, but I imagine that... Uh, I, I made the reference to the continuity of the macroeconomic team in charge. If you look at who's there running economic policy in Russia, uh, they have the longest experience of any G20 country. I mean, at, at all levels. Um, you know, the head of the central bank, she was a deputy economy minister during the 1998 crisis. Uh, Silwanov was uh, a, de a department director in, the, in Minfin. Um, uh, if you go right through uh, the, the uh, upper governing group in Russia, they all were there during the 98 crisis. They remember. So their primary concern is with macroeconomic stability. They can deliver that, and they will probably continue as long as they are the ones running the policy. So if, in fact, there were even to be a collapse in government revenues from other sor sources, I I suspect that what would happen would be significant cuts in expenditure, not uh, efforts to significantly raise revenues. Bill. What more hands do we have up here? Go ahead, Bill. Thank you. Uh, Bill Veal, uh, retired Foreign Service. I uh, wanted to ask if there was a, a difference that you noticed between the impact of sanctions on uh, state enterprise activities as opposed to the private sector, and does that difference, if it exists, make any difference? It's a good question. I'm, I, I, I don't really <laughs> want to shoot from the hip. Um, I, I think that, uh, uh, from what I understand, state concerns are probably more aware of, of, of sanctions and possibly getting in trouble with sanctions uh, than, than private sector companies. Um, but I'm, I don't ha really have any direct evidence of it. I'd have to follow up on that. Okay. Let's have a show of hands again here because we're getting close. So let's go in the back row then. You all, and then right here. Okay. We'll take three this time. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm Randy Bregman with the Denton's Law Firm. If what you say about, if the purpose of a number of the sanctions is to change Russian behavior, mm. if you say nobody's in, nobody cares about the sanctions, they've sort of learned to live with them and they're going to be around forever. What is there any possibility of changing of influencing Russian behavior? And if there's not, maybe we shouldn't have the sanctions. <laughs> okay, hold that thought, Yuval. <laughs> uh, sort of uh, Yuval Weber, Daniel Morgan Graduate School. Um, so maybe a similar question to to the last one. You describe sort of the Russian elite or sort of the Russian public's view of sanctions as 
you know, in a very passive way. Whatever's happening in U.S. or foreign domestic politics, uh, we can't do anything about it. But the sanctions are rooted in things that United States and European governments really don't like, such as the annexation of Crimea, going into uh, Donbass, election interference, and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. So there is some aspect of Russian behavior at the root of it. But you've also described basically Russia's uh, response is macroeconomic stability, uh, maintaining liquidity through trade and budget surpluses, and basically increasing resilience, adjustment on the people, etc. So when you put all these things together, the foreign policy agenda of, the, of Russia as being pretty stable, the, the resilience strategy is also being pretty stable. Do you sort of foresee that this is going to be basically an indefinite response to an indefinite crisis, that there is no change to Russian behavior coming this way or that. Okay. We're going to take one last question here. Thank you. Olivia Kitt. So um, you also said that the European nations are less likely um, to worry about trying to take off the sanctions or on their part. but. What do you have to say for the Italian Prime Minister who has um, basically said that he would like to see the sanctions uplifted from uh, Russia? Can I start with an uh, answer to your question first, if I may? Because um, it, 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 it intrigues me and when I talk to my European friends and, and you know, like, how does this work? And uh, actually, it was a former Italian diplomat schoolmate of mine, actually, at SAIS, who said to me recently, <laughs> he said, you know, um, we Italians have learned how to uh, bargain pretty well over the over the millennia, and so um, if if we're if he's suggesting that we may uh, lift, uh, refuse to go along with the renewal six monthly sanctions, um, uh, you probably need to find out what it is that he really wants. Okay, uh, because it's Italy's not going to get a lot for you know undermining this European uh, consensus. So there's probably something that Italy wants. And so anyway, that was his answer to that. And I guess I don't, I'll pass that on. Um, the, uh, in, in terms of, of uh, and the gentleman in the back, your, your, your question about the um, sanctions regime, I was just going to answer Yuval by saying, um, uh, yes, it will continue. I mean, I, I don't see anything that's going to stop it on the Russian side. They're not going, I don't think they're, they're going to change policies consciously under, because of sanctions. They may change policies for other reasons. Um, I'm not sure, you know, I'm, I'm not a foreign policy expert, so I don't know if they want to stay in Syria or not, if they want to, uh, you know, what, what they intend to do. Uh, about Ukraine. I, I guess they want to keep Crimea forever, though. Um, but uh, other than that, you know, maybe other things are negotiable. Uh, maybe even traditional diplomacy, where, you know, you give us something and we'll give you something might, uh, might, uh, come, into, might come into play. Uh, but on its own, I don't see anything which is going to change uh, among uh, the, the Russians' attitudes um, towards the sanctions that would cause American reactions to say, well, we'll lighten, lighten uh, the, the sanctions at some point, which leads to really your, your question about, well, so if that's the case, then why pursue the sanctions? And of course, I'm not the one who can possibly answer that. I guess you have to look some of your neighbors here in Washington. Um, because I naively was asking uh, Yuval earlier that, um, but it just shows that I'm just an economist, that, you know, why can't traditional diplomacy, where, you know, you, you trade things that you really care about for something that somebody else cares about, why can't you get a trade-off? And you've always dancing around that question, trying to give me a sophisticated answer to why mm -hmm. traditional diplomacy just doesn't work, uh, because there's so little common linkages between Russia and, uh, and the U.S. Um, and, and if that's the case, then, you know, um, maybe sanctions are the only instrument, I guess that's what your conclusion was, that sanctions are the only instrument that's available um, that's can, that can be used for signaling purposes, even if it's considered to be rather 
or totally ineffective. Qu question in the back. So I'm also an historian and not a, um, a foreign policy person or, a, or an economist. Catherine Schuler, I'm uh, a fellow here. I have a question. Um, so one of the things that I've read about both the imperial period and the, uh, and, the, and the Soviet period, and I've had this experience myself in uh, Russia and talking to ordinary people, and I'll put that in quotes, mm -hmm. is um, the idea of learned helplessness. And what, what I've encountered with Russians on the street, um, uh, uh, in hotels, is that you'll ask them about Mr. Putin's policies, and they'll have an answer, but then they'll say, this is not something we can do anything about. We just have to live our lives from day to day. These people are, you know, this is not even a sphere that we care about. Um, and so I'm interested in your response to that, and I'm also interested, it seemed to me in 2016, uh, in early 2017, that there was quite an interest, at least among the ruling elite in having the sanctions lifted, or at least that's certainly the story that we got um, about the June meeting and about Michael Flynn, and that um, uh, at least for Mr. Putin, having, Russian san having sanctions lifted was a very important thing. So I'm wondering if you could talk to that just a, a bit. Go ahead. Okay, well, just um, I, th I think in the earlier days of the sanctions, I mean, they started in the in the spring of 2014. In the earlier days of sanctions, I think that yes, there were there was a desire to uh, to get rid of them um, because from the Russians' point of view, it all seemed to be based on a misunderstanding about you know whether whether it was about Ukraine or or about uh, Syria or about election interference. Um, but it's, it's, it's subsequent to that, actually. I mean, that, that's a, it's a relevant point. Uh, but as time goes on, they, they just realize that this is not going to happen. That uh, whatever they, what arguments they tried to make, and I think that the turning point for the Russians on, on that was um, after the alleged uh, Skripal poisoning in March uh, of last year, uh, that uh, they just said, look, um, there's nothing we can do about this, so we, we're just resigned to, the, to, to this continuing. Um, and uh, so in terms of what people on the street were saying that we can't do anything about it, um, I don't know. I, I certainly talked to a lot of, you know, student age Russians who, um, you know, they're about as enthusiastic as voting as uh, you know my um, my relatives down in Memphis. I mean, I don't know. They they <laughs> they show differing enthusiasm, but but they you know they 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 have some inclination to do that. I I don't think it's uh, politics is the overwhelming concern to the to most of these people, but sure, not, just like it is here, I guess. So in, in conclusion, Martin, you, you've, you've described a very resilient co economy, one that has restored an element of macroeconomic stability. Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of the long-term 21st century future, does Russia have a competitive and innovative economy, kind of, or is there, does it have one at least imagined up, or is it just going to continue to rely on oil, gas, and natural resources? Um, and in, in that sense, is staying even still, in reality, falling behind? Uh, it's not just about oil, gas, and natural resources. Let me make that point. I mean, you've got a country of 146 million people, and there are, they're, they're pretty well educated. So they are certainly capable of a lot of in, uh, innovation, and you certainly see that uh, in companies like Yandex and, and, and you know, the, uh, uh, all kinds of fintech uh, like uh, this online bank Tinkoff and, and Sparebank. I mean, there's all kinds of, uh, of startups that are, are very dynamic. I mean, you go around Moscow and some of the other cities and you see these old Soviet industrial parks that have been turned into, you know, like the Tribeca part of New York. I mean, it's really quite, quite impressive. Um, so I think that there is a lot going on which is not related to natural resources. The problem is really how do you 
how do you harness that energy um, to really build a more dynamic economy? And, and you know, that opens up the whole hornet's nest of questions about state control. There are too many par uh, large state enterprises uh, that are not innovative. Um, uh, you've got the whole problem of the rule of law, which, you know, Michael Calvi is just the latest prominent victim, but there are thousands of business people who are sitting in pretrial detention or in, or in jail uh, simply because they, they alienated a partner or somebody wanted, got greedy. Um, and that's not the way it should be. And that's got to change. Um, but it will probably, like most change in life, I, am, I would imagine, but I'm saying this from my perspective, it probably requires some kind of crisis to change things. And so that's why um, uh, when I was uh, talking to Yuval before the event and we were talking about what could happen in the longer term in a post-Putin world, I said, don't hold your breath. I mean, because the populace that you'll get who will do this is probably not someone that we would really like to see as a partner, but. Well, you, you ended almost on an optimistic note, so I'm, I'm grateful for that. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Gilman. Thank you, the Daniel Morgan Graduate School in Uval. Thank you all for coming, and we look forward to seeing you at future Kennan Institute events. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Okay. My pleasure.